Melanie from Cologne, who's a crime writer. We have Angela from South, uh, South Africa, right? South Africa is correct. Where, where are you right now? In Johannesburg. From Johannesburg. Hello, Angela. Hello. <laughs> and then uh, another crime writer, but the, the, there are other things you, you write. And I forgot to say that Melanie, she, she even wrote a book about, I think, Lady Gaga. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> and Angela, you, you write more than more than just crime novels. You, you write other things too. Yes. Um, okay. So my first novel was a, a proper uh, crime thriller, and then after that, I wrote what is categorized as women's <laughs> literature. So it was more kind of um, romance, not really romance. It was uh, a coming of age tale around you know four university friends, and then. Uh, the third book uh, is Black Widow Society. It's another crime novel. And then my fourth book was more kind of social commentary, uh, The Blessed Girl. And then my latest book, Critical But Stable, is I would call it, it's, it's suspense, uh, but it's, it's, the focus is not really on crime as well. I think it's more social comment, commentary as well. Okay, thank you very much. I think uh, you two will um, certainly talk about uh, what is crime fiction and, and uh, about the, the variety of the genre. And um, Pippa Goldschmidt, who is in Frankfurt at the moment. Hello, Pippa. She, she, will, she will ask you the questions. She will lead um, through this conversation. And uh, I think she's already prepared lots of questions for the two of you. I'm very much looking forward to, to, to listening to your talk. Thank you all for being here. And um, i see you later then. Have Thanks. Fun. Thanks very much, Sari. Uh, it's, it's great to be here. Um, so I'm going to be moderating this evening's discussion between Melanie and Angela. Um, uh, I, I think, so you are based in very different countries in many ways. And I, what I would like to talk about this evening is how you both use crime uh, in your writing to explore society uh, within your countries. And I want to talk about the differences and perhaps some of the similarities in your work. Um, I, I'd like to perhaps do a little bit of more of an introduction. I know Zoe's always, uh, already sort of briefly introduced you. I'd like to say a little bit more about you and then we can sort of start drawing out um, some of what you're interested in writing in. I'd like to start with you, Melanie, and just say a little bit about your sort of where, you've, where you're uh, based and the fact that um, you've had four novels published, uh, I think, is that right? Uh, your first one was the was uh, De Falla, The Trap, published six years ago in 2015. Um, and that won the Stuttgart Crime Fiction Prize. And you've had your works optioned for film and uh, published in many different languages. Um, you also write uh, radio plays and nonfiction. Uh, and you've written a book on creativity and how it makes us braver and stronger and happier. So perhaps we might talk about that too, so I think that's interesting. And as Zoe already said, you've written a book on Lady Gaga. Uh, so you, you are clearly someone who encompasses many different uh, types of writing and different genres and you uh, to go backwards uh, in time a little bit uh, you studied literature and media studies at uh, university and then you became a journalist before you became a writer and you were to go back f further in time uh, there's a reason why I'm doing that um, you were born in what was then East Germany before you moved to West Germany um, and so, Angela, I would like to introduce you to. Um, you also studied journalism and uh, also worked as a journalist. And uh, you are the first black writer to write crime fiction in South Africa. And that, to me, is, is really fascinating. Um, so we're, we're going to talk about that, uh, about uh, where your crime fiction is based in the type of societies that, that you write in. Um, as you've already said, you, you, you switch between genres, as, as Melanie does. Uh, you write thrillers, uh, where there's a uh, sort of nature of suspense in the, in the telling of the tale and the unfolding of the action. But you also write uh, comedy. And I think uh, The Blessed Girl, 
was long listed for the British Comedy Women in Print Prize, which is fantastic. And I just finished reading that book today. And it is funny, but it's also really sad. It made me cry in places. Oh, and boy. it's it's <laughs> it's really it's really moving too. It's I found it a really interesting, really interesting book. And your next book, Critical But Stable, will be published soon. It's published already. Oh, brilliant. Fantastic. <laughs> So, so, the, so, Melanie, the reason why I did your biography backwards, as it were, through time, is that I think this is one way that classic crime thrillers are written in a way. They kind of play with time. They, they tease the reader by unfolding events that uh, allow us to connect the, the past with the present. And um, I just wonder if you could say a little bit more about uh, the techniques, the skills, and how you do that, because it's so difficult to do that, to construct a complex narrative that, that, that plays with time in a sense that is satisfactory for the reader to, to read and gives us clues. Yes, absolutely. And I think you're touching on a point that is very important for everything I've done, especially for my last novel, which isn't out in English yet, The Woods. Um, because I think um, even more than crime, I'm interested in secrets. And secrets obviously stem from somewhere in the past. And I'm always interested much more in character than in structure, even though um, the structure is what's propping everything up. Um, and I always try to... Um, I always try to be concerned with the characters first and think about structure afterwards. Mm -hmm. And um, in a way, I always had in, in every single one of my thrillers, let me think, yes, I always had um, two different timelines in the book, the, the present and, and the past. Mm -hmm. And um, just to keep things simple for me, I was always trying to treat both um, both strings of narrative as the presence mm -hmm. while I was writing. So I was never going back and forth between chapters in the in the past and in the present while writing, but it was always um, like creating one string of narrative, one strand of narrative um, first. And then when I was finished with that, I went and worked on everything else that was happening in the past. Like I was never, um, so the reason behind that is I was always trying to make everything feel like the present, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Mm -hmm. So yeah. because of course, in hindsight, you're always smarter and I'm always trying to um, write everything like it's happening right now. And then I'm, into, then I'm putting it into the narrative and um, tweaking it to make it the past. Mm -hmm. um, I'm unable to, to explain it any better, but um, that's how I'm going about it. And I think um, for me, I, I think it would be practically impossible to, um, to write a thriller without um, keeping one leg in, in the past and the past of, um, of my characters, yeah. Yeah, Angela, I got that sense that you were also doing this in in, uh, in the Blessed One too. That first of all, we see uh, the the present life of, uh, of Bondley, and then we we get clues about her past, uh, and then you start to open up her past, and we start to make those those sort of deep connections between what is what has happened and what is happening, and that gives us such a great insight into her. Yeah. Yes, um, I did that quite a bit. I mean, the, the Blessed Girl is interesting because as much as it's dark comedy, um, I suppose as the reader, because you are reading uh, Bontle in first person and you, she is an, an unreliable narrator. So <laughs> in a lot of ways as a writer, as, as the reader, you need to kind of play that detective role of trying to figure out how much of what she's saying is real and is true and, and how much of it isn't. And 
it's only towards the end that you really get a sense, a fuller sense of who this person is. And you've been relying on her as the narrator um, to tell her story. So I do, I do that with Blessed Girl. And um, I think with, my, with a lot of my thriller novels, I do that quite a bit. Um, for instance, with Critical But Stable, um, it's, a suspense, it's a suspenseful novel and it starts with a dead body. Um, and so it starts at the beginning, uh, sorry, it starts at the end <laughs> because we end with this dead body. So um, we, we, it starts with a young man who's looking down on this body of this beautiful woman who's lying in his, bed, in his bedroom. And so we don't know what it is that caused her death, uh, but she, he speaks about her um, with such lo longing and, and love. And so we're not sure, did he kill her? Did she, how did she come to be in his room? And, and, and you know, be in the state. Um, and then we get to know the other characters in the novel who actually make the life of the novel. Um, it, it's three couples, they seem to be happy. They have, they're in long-term marriages. Um, but at the same time, as we get to uh, unravel each of their lives, we realize that as much as they want to project this picture of marital bliss, uh, because they all belong to one uh, society, they belong to um, something that we call here in South Africa a Stockfell. A Stockfell is kind of an investment club, which is a common thing uh, from the days of apartheid that uh, you know uh, black people used to do, where you would come together and you'd collect money like a savings club, and it was because there was no so so we didn't have access to banking, um, and so it became kind of a a bigger thing than just an investment club or a savings club. It became a social thing where people come together uh, every month and they get to know each other, they get into each other's lives. And so these couples are in each other's lives and, and because they are married and they project this uh, picture of uh, black success, the black that we call it a, the black diamond phenomenon. <laughs> so, so, so everybody wants to kind of give off this air of uh, having it all, uh, but then we realize that they don't really have it all, and so we make that connection that if one of these three couples, uh, one of the wives, must be the dead body, but who, which one is it? So it's not a, a who done it; it's who got done. Yes. Some, one of these wives is the one is the dead body. So <laughs> who had done? So that is that is kind of uh, 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 just flipping the script, for instance, on the on the suspense novel or on the whodunit kind of mode of um, crime fiction storytelling. Love. Yeah. Sorry, Melanie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I, and I loved the way too that you. You, you really embedded these characters in their society. You really show us uh, what it's what it's like for sort of uh, wealthy black entrepreneurs to be living in South Africa, and the way that they um, where they've got their wealth from, and how they use their wealth. And uh, I really uh, it really gave, gave me a slice of life. I, you know, I, I don't know much about modern sort of South Africa, and I really get the sense in reading your novels. I can I can really see how how these how your characters are living, and what I really liked about Critical but Stable was that these these characters are flawed but they're also likable too they're very real three-dimensional characters and they, they really so they really come off the page um, and that really that really provides the energy that's that keeps that keeps the story going you know you really want to find out what happens in these characters lives and I think Melanie that is also true of your books too and that's um, so I think what, what I really wanted to say at the beginning of this is well you write very different types of literature in some ways but with with both your writing it is so compulsively readable I really had to read to these books to the end to find out what was going on and and I think it's not just the plot it's not just a sort of structure the scaffolding or the plot that that sort of makes um, makes the reader want to do this made me want to do this it's, it's the characterization um, so for instance uh, Melanie um, your book the shadow uh, with you have a deeply unreliable narrator um, I found uh, she can't trust her own reality and the reader is finding it really difficult to sort of trust what is going on and you get this sense of what is real outside the window in in, in Vienna and what is going on in his head and they are really sort of horribly all mixed up um, so, uh, could you say a little bit more about how, again, how you how you wrote that novel? <laughs> because uh, it, the the complex layering is what makes it uh, really 
a satisfying read, I think. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you think so. It was really fun writing it too, even though it was um, quite the challenge. It um, was my third novel or the third, uh, third novel I got published. And um, I set out to write it in, I think, 2016. And I was, um, when I'm setting out to write a novel, um, I always start with tone and with the feeling. And mm -hmm. at the time I was upset because Trump got elected and in Germany, we had um, a strong uprising of a far right wing party, AfD, and I was upset. It wasn't a good time in my life, even though job wise, everything was really lovely. And I was just working and traveling and everything um, was fine for me personally. And um, I came up with this premise while traveling, um, while being in Vienna with my, uh, with the book I had written beforehand. And v Vienna is so beautiful, but when you go there in February, when it's really cold, the city is, um, it has, it has a sense of, it's a bit macabre, I think, Vienna, when it's super cold and dark. And I came up with this plot of a journalist who just um, who just moved to Vienna from Berlin, and she feels super super alone because she has this. She just um, broke up with her boyfriend, and she has this new job in Austria, and people aren't really warming up to her, and her new super empty apartment isn't warming up either, and she has a very strange um, encounter in the street with a woman, maybe homeless. Anyway, Mysterious is coming up to her and saying a really strange thing to her. And she's saying, you're going to kill someone and you're going to kill a man named Arthur Grimm. And I'm going to tell you when you're going to do it. It's going to be the 11th of February. And um, this is rather disturbing to the protagonist, to Nora, obviously, um, not because she believes in, um, in people telling her the future, but, um, and she doesn't know a man named Arthur Grimm, but the 11th of February is the date that means something to her because someone she really loved died, obviously long in the past. And um, in a way she feels, um, she feels responsible for this death. And she has buried, buried this. And um, for some reason, reality um, begins to shift after this mysterious encounter. And I think, um, I think there are, while I was writing and constructing, different things were at play. And I don't want to, obviously, I don't want to give away the ending, but um, Nora is the protagonist being manipulated. And we have a couple of Me Too elements and stalking in the novel, but we also have this, um, this strong element of the past, as you mentioned beforehand. Um, Nora is, people are able to manipulate Nora because Nora is feeling so guilty about the past and um, the way the past is trickling into the present and maybe into a future is what I found so interesting about that. And um, yeah. Yeah, that's that's how I how the how the novel came to pass and constructing it. I was really um, trying to um, I think in this novel more than any other I've ever written. I was working with different drafts because it was so hard to for me to to make it work to make it believable that this grown smart wo woman is behaving the way she's behaving. And I was just drafting and drafting, drafting. I think we had seven, eight, nine drafts of the novel until I had the feeling <laughs> now it's working out. And it's also a mix between um, a mystery and, and a gothic novel in a way, which is a genre I really, really like. And so um, in the end, it's all realistic. In the end, it's, it's, uh, it's not like mm. even King, uncanny, mm. uh, supernatural stuff, but um, that was an inspiration. For, for the book too. 
I think it, it does feel quite uncanny. I think that's a really good word to use because you use the setting of Vienna. Uh, like you said, it is a very beautiful uh, city, but it has some very uncanny elements to it. And someone moving there from another country in the middle of winter um, could quite easily feel um, not, not at home in, in this place. And I think you convey that beautifully through the, through the details of, of Nora's uh, pr pretty grim life in, in the city in some ways. And again, it's that mixture of the past and the present, the past influencing the present. Um, so what, what I was thinking when I was reading both your work in the past couple of weeks is what do we actually mean by crime? Um, what, what are we talking about? When we talk about crime, like the, the title of this talk, Crime Pays, what do we actually mean by crime? Because the classic thriller is usually constructed around murder or something, uh, something uh, sort of like of some kind of violent crime that happens between individuals. But crime happens on much sort of wider scales than that. Uh, we have uh, crimes that happen because people feel that pressure in the societies that we live in. And I think, Angela, you really show that to good effect in your books. So perhaps um, it'd be interesting to hear from you. What exactly interests you about crime writing? Why, why you use the genre of crime writing to... Why do you write in this genre? And what, what do you think of as crime? Angela, you go first. Yeah, I think... Um, the crime genre with more women writing crime fiction is evolving and I love its evolution. I'm excited by it because um, I think crime affects women or the, our view of what crime is in, in the world is different from that of men. And so, for instance, you look at um, detective novels, which are usually kind of... Um, the focus is there's a dead body or there's some kind of a crime scene that occurs. And then, um, you know, the main thing is the investigation and the detective, the, the detection that goes, that, that the reader has to walk through along with the writer to get to a conclusion. Um, but I think with the rise of, for instance, domestic crime fiction, um, which I really, really love, <laughs> um, it, it's really taking a, 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 a shift. And I think it's becoming more, psychological, first of all, and it's more internalized the way that it's, it's depicted on paper. And I, 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 I think it's good that women are writing crime fiction because, you know, for instance, with somebody like me, who's a woman living in South Africa, which is um, a country that really has some of the most kind of horrific <laughs> crime statistics, um, it's, 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 it's quite a real thing for me, for instance, like living as a, as a woman living in Johannesburg. So my first novel, uh, Red Ink, um, was very real for me as well uh, in, in an, on a number of levels. So first of all, I started writing it as a biography. Um, I was a journalist at the time. Well, I, I had been a journalist before and I had reached out to um, the serial killer, Moses Sitone. He was kind of the first um, major case of um, serial homicide in South Africa. And as a reporter, it was a case that I was following quite closely more, mainly because his victims looked like me at the time. It was young black women uh, living in the city, you know, starting out in life. So I was in my twenties at the time. So I would have kind of been like the perfect profile for the kind of victims that he targeted. And so he would lure these women with the promise of work, um, which again, um, our social economics are quite dire. Um, they were dire then, they're even worse now <laughs> for different reasons. And so it is that, um, desperation for you know an opportunity to start out in life and in a place where there's very few opportunities um, so he used to lure these women by uh, promising them employment he would pretend that he's kind of a, a, um, a recruiter you know um, so so I followed the case until he was arrested and went and, and and you know the trial and everything and once he was sentenced and incarcerated I wrote him a letter and I said that I want to come and interview him. I want to understand why he did what he did. I mean, obviously I didn't put it that way. I put it very nicely so that he basically calls me and I go and meet with him in prison. Um, and he didn't respond to my, to my letter for years and years. And I'd, I'd, left, I'd left journalism by the time he contacted me. Fortunately, I kept the same number. And when I went to see him, I mean, he was uh, a perfectly charming man. And... Uh, 
And for me, it was that need to understand the psyche of somebody who would violate women like that. He would rape these women and he would kill them and he would uh, sometimes tie them with their underwear and, 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 and leave them at the scene. Um, so for me, crime in South Africa is not something that I see that, that there's not a, a huge distance between me and being a potential victim of crime. So a lot of it comes from wanting not to feel that fear, not to live in that state of um, not knowing and, and, and kind of uh, constantly worrying about, could I be like the next victim of a, a violent crime? Um, and so it's quite a personal experience and it's quite an internalized experience. So, so for me, that is, that is where it comes from. And also the fact that the, our, our gender-based violence statistics are quite high as well. So again, it's not something that, that's distant, like the, the perpetrator may not necessarily be a stranger or most of the time is not a stranger, it's somebody close to home. Um, and so it's the need to understand that phenomenon. So that's why a lot of my crime fiction, um, other than Red Ink, Red Ink is literally the story that I've just told you, but just fictionalized. Um, but a lot of it, uh, for instance, Black Widow Society, it's a group of women um, who form a secret society to, to eliminate their errant husbands, you know? <laughs> um, and so, yeah, it's, for me, it's, 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 it's a personal thing and it's, 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 it's about facing the big bad monster like head on by, you know, trying to make sense of the psychology of crime. Absolutely. So, um, so, uh, so Melanie, uh, you were also a journalist too before you turned to writing novels. Uh, do you think there's a link between uh, being a journalist and the skills that are needed to, to write to write crime books? Uh, or do you think you're also drawing upon your experience as Angela has done? Yeah, um, I think um, I think there's a lot of authors who were journalists before. And I think, um, and I think it's just about, we are drawn to writing, right? I think we're drawn to stories, we're drawn to writing, and then the step, I mean, it's, it's a completely different form of writing, obviously, but I think the step to take is, is rather obvious. When I'm talking to um, ex-colleagues of mine that are still working in newsrooms, Practically all of them have a novel somewhere, or if 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 only in their heads. And um, I just want to say what I found so fascinating about uh, everything Angela just told us about that serial killer and writing about it and wanting to explore these topics um, because she might um, she might look like the victims and and might be in in a terrible uh, shifted reality be the next victim. I think um, what's so interesting about women and crime writing is that um, even in in crime reading is um, I think writing and reading is um, is about taking control of events, even if they're fictional, or in that case, not even fictional. Um, I'm always asked when I'm doing readings or stuff um, about why is it that so many women like to read these gruesome novels and like to, um, even in countries that have these high crime rates, even higher than Germany, um, how come that you're watching horrible news and afterwards you feel like, reading a gruesome novel. And I think it's actually about taking control back because even, even more than with um, other mediums like television or movies, um, with the movie, you're, you, you don't really have control. Somebody else picked everything, but with a book you can choose, you can choose the pace and you can like skip pages that you can cope with maybe and you can just close it and put it away if you don't want to deal with it anymore and, and and take it back when you feel ready and I think writing about things like that is is like the heightened version of that mm -hmm. and um, that's at least how I feel about it so um, but that just came to mind while Angela was talking because it never became um, that clear to me as uh, as just as I was just listening to her and um, yeah, I think it's fascinating. It's, a, it's an interesting way to take control and a very, very soft, but very, very powerful way to take control. 
I think I think that's right. So I think there is something about reading. There's a more active way of interacting with the material than than perhaps more passively watching a screen or listening yeah. to something. Um, reading, you have more control over the time frame in which you're reading, and perhaps it requires more of the sort of imaginative skills, uh, imagination with within the brain. Um, but I think what, what you're saying about uh, women reading and writing crime is, is really important because I think crime writing is a really powerful way of exposing uh, misogyny, um, which isn't necessarily a, a crime in itself, although there's some discussion in Britain about whether it should be. Um, but it's definitely a, a way of, of thinking, um, a sort of state of mind that is very closely linked to, to, the, to the worst crimes. And I think uh, what your both both your writing does is it really clearly links that sort of state of mind, sort of mis misogynistic thinking, and shows how crimes develop um, as a result of that. Yeah, I think it's um, oftentimes when I'm talking to to female friends or even male friends about misogyny and all these topics. Um, a sentence that super often comes up from me and my girlfriends is, I wish you could, um, you, you could see through my eyes as a male or walk in my shoes. And that's exactly what a novel is doing, yeah. especially um, if, it's, uh, if it's written in the first person. Um, if you're at all empathetic and you're reading a novel like that and you're looking um, through the eyes of the protagonist and feeling what, what she's feeling, I think that's really powerful. And it's, yeah. for me, I think it's, the only way um, a, a male person is is able to experience that. Movies don't really give you that. I think books books give you that. I agree. Um, I see there's a question here. Um, oh, thank you for picking that up. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it says the Sitole case was not just continental, but global. Angela is a fellow journalist um, um, who's also fascinated by crime. Would you expound? What you meant by you found this <laughs> perfect each other. You know, I was not about to marry him, don't worry. <laughs> uh, did you glean dark psychotic insights from that interview that you used in your work? And if so, how? All right. Sorry, I don't know if I was <laughs> supposed to. No, thanks. Uh, thanks for picking up the question. Sorry. Oh, I should be picking up the questions. So thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so no, no. When I said he was perfectly charming, of course, you know, uh, preparing for that first meeting with him, I was expecting the worst. And 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 the other um, um, cold reality that I faced when I went to see him is that I expected to be separated from him by prison bars, but I wasn't. Um, there's an, the, the, the visiting area, it's a maximum security prison, but the visiting area was an open um, it's, it's like a park. It literally looks like a park because it's an open area and then open air area and there's little parking benches, you know, like those cemented ones. Um, and so I was sitting with him just as if I'm visiting a friend. Um, so, you know, my heart was just pounding in my chest and I thought, oh my gosh, like I made, <laughs> made a mistake. I don't want to be looking at this man. Um, and he put me at ease. And when I said perfectly charming, the first thing I thought is this is how he got his victims because he doesn't look like a serial killer. He looks like a, a choir boy or, yeah. you know, um, and, and, and often, often, in, often in most cases, that is, that is how um, psychopaths kind of disguise themselves and you're their victims, that they don't look like, you know, the big bad monster that, that we expect them to look like. So, and did I glean any, any uh, insights from interacting with him, which I did for, for, for a period of about six months? Uh, I certainly did. Um, you know, the first thing that he did was to paint himself as a victim. You know, he told me, you know, the story of his um, childhood and the traumas that he claimed to have suffered. I don't know how much of it was true and how much of it wasn't. I, I'm pretty sure some of it was true and some of it was made up, you know, just for effect. Um, and, you know, the misogyny in him, he told me that his mother, he felt abandoned by his mother. So it's the mother figure abandonment. And, and so he hated women because of that. You know, he thought all women were bitches. He hated women because of that. He kept on repeating that kind of narrative. And, uh, and, and, and he also was very bitter towards a specific woman who was a victim of his because he used to rape women and not kill them. So this one 
woman fought him, fought hard, was able to identify him and was able to report him to the police and he got arrested. And he said, he said to me, after that woman did that, he knew he was not just gonna rape them. He was gonna kill them because if you don't kill them, then they get to, they, you can end up in prison because they can get to identify you. So, uh, I mean, there's, not, there's, there, there's no bad childhood or any excuse that, uh, in, you know, there's, there's people who had bad childhoods who are amazing people in the world. So I don't think this narrative that if you're damaged, then you are going to be, a, yes, you may be a damaged person, but it doesn't mean that you're obviously gonna go around killing people. So I think a psychopath is a psychopath. I think there's people who are born with, uh, who, who lack um, empathy, who lack normal human emotions that, we expect, you know, uh, human beings to have. And, and that's kind of the um, um, psychology of somebody like that. And I, I don't think that it takes childhood trauma to turn you into a killer because there's many, many people in the world who endured unimaginable childhood trauma who don't go around killing people. So that, yeah, so that, is, that was my main, I don't know, take out from that experience. Wow, it sounds kind of terrifying, even when you're just uh, sort of uh, telling us uh, about this. It sounds kind of terrifying, even when you're just sort of telling us about this. Sorry. Um, yeah, but um, uh, sorry. Thank you so much for that, um, Angela. Um, but you didn't answer the question that I was very interested in as a writer. Did you get any insights from those that's the, uh, six half a year of interactions that you've now put into your book, I mean, apart from him playing victim, or even that, did that now feature that? Uh, no, no, of you know, course. Uh, yes, yes, it was. It was so did you gather was, anything no, at all? Yes, yes of course. Using well, your work. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Um, I, I, I'm say, I was saying, yes, of course, it made up, um, you know, quite a rich kind of um, context for understanding that character because the book had a very clear protagonist which was the journalist the female journalist and a, a very clear antagonist which was the serial killer but what was interesting about the book what I did in the book is that um, and, and, and it kind of happened in real life as well so there's also uh, kind of blurred lines between you know reality and what actually happened in the fictional uh, telling of the story is that I you know, through time, going to visit this man and sitting down, the strange thing, and, it, and it's something that I'm even ashamed to put it in these specific terms, but it, the strange thing is that they developed kind of, I don't want to call it a friendship because it wasn't really a friendship as such, but he really started seeing me as his mate, as his buddy, like as somebody that, that he can talk about the weekend soccer. So the strange thing is you're talking to this person about you know, the score between Paris and Paris are Chiefs, which, which are the main kind of uh, our main uh, soccer teams here. And you let down your guard because you're thinking, you're laughing. You're thinking, you know, you, because you forget that this is a serial killer. You talk and you talk. And then next thing you get into the, the reason why we're meeting, you know, and we get into, you know, what he did, the stuff that he did. And then you're jarred back into this reality that this is not your buddy. This is not your friend that you talk about soccer with. This is somebody who killed 45 women, you know? Um, so, so, so I did use a lot of that, of course, in the, in the, in the book, but I really kind of uh, pushed it to the extreme because in the book, people around the journalist's life, around the, the protagonist's life start dying while this person is in prison. So then the question is who's, who's behind uh, these murders, you know? Um, so it did give me kind of a rich context to base this really um, kind of gritty crime thriller on. Um, but it was a very really disturbing experience. The entire thing was, 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 was really disturbing, which is why my next novel after that was so light. It was kind of another con <laughs> was a comedy. I had to get away from that. Um, this is so fascinating. And I was just wondering, you were a journalist when you approached this guy, right? About his, and, um, and you weren't a novelist by then. Why did you decide? I, I, mean, 
dream of being a journal, I mean, a novelist at that time. I mean, well, it, I dreamt of it, but it was very really kind of vague and far-fetched, yeah. That's so interesting because I was just wondering, um, why did you decide not to like write a bit, a big nonfiction piece about him? But why did you choose that fiction? You must have answered that a, a thousand times, but it's super interesting to me. Um, why did you choose fiction for that story? My intention was not to, to write fiction. Uh, my intention was to write it as, um, you know, I mean, his life story, but he ended up, acting like a psychopath. So he would write me, so for instance, he asked for my address. And of course I didn't give him my physical address. I gave him my postal address. So he would send me his case files, which was the purpose of that correspondence. Um, so at first he would send me, you know, um, court documents, which was great research for me. But then he started writing me these very long love letters, you know, declarations of, you know, and. It was so disturbing because you could see that this person is living in his own head where there's this great romance that's developing between me and him. And, um, and so, so I, so, so, and then when, when that happened also, the other thing is he started then changing his story because now he's a suitor. So now he's not, he's not a serial kid. So now he's wanting to charm me and make me think that he, They didn't really do all of those horrible things, you know? Um, and so I was frustrated because it was a way, I, I, for me, it was, uh, this is a waste of my time, honestly. Like, that's how I viewed it. It was, you, um, um, we started out, you were telling me the truth, and now you're changing kind of effects and incidents because you think that it makes you look bad in my eyes. <laughs> so that's why I actually abandoned the project, to be honest. <laughs> Makes perfect sense, yeah. <laughs> wow, what a story. <laughs> wouldn't you, Melanie? Wouldn't you abandon you? Wouldn't you desert it? <laughs> I'm just, I just need to uh, wrap my head around that you did that in the first place because I would have been terrified. I would never um, have had the stomach to meet up with the guy. I'm fascinated that you did that. And I think it's great. And um, And of course, it makes perfect sense that it's impossible to write non uh, sound nonfiction um, with just one very unreliable narrator. Of course, you can't do that. So I think uh, making, making <laughs> fiction of it is a very, uh, very clever way to take the power back from the narrative and making it your own. That's really smart. Yeah. yeah thank you. So I'd like to perhaps go back and talk a little bit more about society, the crimes that happen within different types of society. Um, I think it's really interesting that uh, that you you both live in countries that have a difficult pasts to, to, to put it to put it uh, mildly both Germany and South Africa as states have committed crimes against their own citizens and citizens of other countries and these these discussions about these crimes uh, sort of state-led crimes are, are ongoing uh, in both Germany and South Africa and that kind of narrative that discussion isn't coming to an end anytime soon so do you think that kind of I mean I think it's quite perhaps more clear in your literature Angela that that does inform the way that you write about crime but do you think Melanie too that also shapes the way you think about crime in, in your novels <laughs> yes, I mean, I think so. I think um, in my novels, um, these these topics are beyond the surface, and I'm I'm infusing that in my stories um, by osmosis more than really writing about it directly. But um, what first comes to mind is my first novel. The Trap, Die Falle, is about a young woman, young author, early 30s, who hasn't left her house in 11 years because she's afraid. And um, what I tend to do is finding, um, finding a plot that um, really acts like 
um, like a disguise for the underlying um, for the underlying topics because um, in the book I was thinking about okay the idea was we have this this person who doesn't leave the house because I thought that would be interesting why is she so afraid what is happening to her and then I decided that her sister had been murdered and that she had seen witnessed the murder and was able to describe the killer but he never got caught and um and she she develops um like real anxiety and panic attacks and she doesn't leave the house anymore and a lot of things develop from that premise but what's what's underlying is that um that the narrator that the first person narrator isn't feeling safe outside because obviously um that's something um i can relate to and um, so it isn't very on the nose and you, um, you probably um, make that connection um, easier if you know that I'm a black author living in a very white country and you can read the book without thinking about why is she feeling so unsafe? Um, is there maybe a metaphor <laughs> behind, behind the murder of a sister? And um, that's, that's how, how I cope with these topics, but it changes. It always depends on how I'm feeling. <laughs> and um, yeah, that's, that's just one example from my books. Yeah, I loved, I, loved I, I did look you up and I loved the premise for that book. I actually went to look for it and I couldn't find it here in this country. I'm going to send you one. I'm going to so send you one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, uh, so what I liked about that and in your work is how crime, crime that happens uh, at a certain point of time can take uh, a long time to, to play out. The implications of these crimes can take generations or so to really become fully known and to sort of work their way to the surface. And of course, that's, that's fantastic material for a novelist because, you, you know, we work with time-based narratives, with stories that happen through different points of time. But I think it's really interesting to explore from a sort of political sense too that uh, crimes that happened generations ago and I think perhaps uh, we, we are realizing that we, we can't just sort of forget about these crimes we need to consider them in some in different types of debates whether it's through fiction or non-fiction um, I'm wondering what your thoughts are about that <clears throat> um, yeah I think I use when it comes to uh, tapping into our history and why we are where we are as modern Black South Africans. I do that mostly with my, what I call, I call them social commentary books because uh, they may be comedic or, I don't know, suspenseful, but at the heart of it is um, this trying to unravel the Black reality, especially from a middle-class point of view. And the reason I do that is because there's really quite a lot of, um, I don't know, there's quite a lot of disturbing uh, developments in the way South Africa as a society is uh, shape is, is, is becoming, you know, the shape that the country is taking our values and our, uh, it's, it's and, and all of it is based on where we come from. So the crime is about that, the greed, the corruption, a lot of it has to do with the history that we come from, because it, we come from lack, we come from, you know, deprivation. So as black South Africans, we just, we lacked, we could see, we knew that this country is, is you know, kind of a mineral rich country. It's got all these amazing, the, the, uh, the, our fauna, flora, everything. We, it, it's a country that seems to have everything. And we are the children of this country that has everything, but we have nothing. And so what has happened, um, you know, at least from my point of view, I mean, it's, it's, it is actually the reality is that with the opportunities that have now sprung up, especially for specifically for Black South Africans because of, you know, legislation like the uh, Black Economic Empowerment, Affirmative Action, um, they, there's just this need now to just grab all of it, to have it all, you know, and um, the urgency to acquire these things that are just so within reach, but um, may not be as tangible. And, and, and the thing is, remember, because of the pol policies, there's this kind of instant, um, th there's um, this nouveau riche kind of thing, like a lot of people are becoming instant millionaires, you know, and, and it comes with 
a lot of um, socioeconomic issues that you can see are going to lead to a lot of danger, like a lot of uh, a lot of problems for our society. Um, and it's already starting to do that. I mean, we've got um, the, the divide between the rich and the poor is, is the greatest anywhere in the world. Um, and, and, and it's something that, that, that bothers me. And so when I talk about kind of the black middle class in books like Critical But Stable and The Blessed Girl, you know, Bundler's pursuit for wealth and her, her willingness to do anything um, to get that wealth without, you know, kind of really doing anything <laughs> um, <laughs> is, a, is, is a common kind of South African thing, you know? Um, and, and so I use my fiction to delve into the things that, that, that bother me the most, you know, that worry me the most about our society. I think, I think when we're writers, it's our concerns and our worries that really drive our writing forwards because that's what energizes us. That's what our brains are sort of thinking about. And that's uh, and another reader kind of picks up on that. Um, so, um, so uh, Melanie, do do you think um, do you think your position in in sort of German society kind of allows you to act a, a bit like a sort of commentator on it, as 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 a black writer, a black German writer? Do you, do you feel that you are able to sort of see clearly uh, the sort of problems with, within society? <clears throat> I'm not really sure because. Um... I'm, I'm not, I, I didn't come from the outside and I'm looking from the outside at German society, but I'm completely immersed. I was born in Germany in the Eastern part while it still was um, the DDR, mm. like socialist and very, very unfree in many ways. And um, I, think, I think in some ways I, I have this perspective because obviously I'm seeing some things differently than um, my white friends. But um, in other parts, I think I'm, I'm just too close. I've never lived anywhere else but in Germany for, for a long time. And I'm, I'm, I'm just immersed in the culture and in this, in this perspective. But what I was just thinking about while, um, while Angela was exploring all those South African topics, and it never really occurred to me was that um, it seems so obvious that a person like me who um, grew up in a country that has this super shameful past um, and then um, spent, the, spent her childhood in that part of the country that was super, super suppressed. And I remember my parents telling me um, to be careful what I tell to my friends at school because you might get in trouble in, in Eastern Germany for maybe expressing opinions um, that, that weren't, um, that, that the authorities didn't like. And, um, and I clearly remember, or I'm clearly aware that Germany is a country of so many secrets and some of us still don't know what their grandparents were doing in World War II or um, all these things in, in two ways, DDR, like the socialist part of it and the Nazi past of Germany. There's so many secrets and so many things um, that are slowly being talked about, but not everywhere. So um, being told um, that I can't get an answer to, to things is something I clearly remember as a child. And um, it seems so obvious that you would be drawn to, to secrets and, um, and just being able to make up satisfying endings to those stories and just making, making up the answers or the, the big revelations to those secrets is um, probably driving some of my writing, I can imagine. I think that I I feel I really feel that living in Germany. Um, I've lived here for a couple of years now. I have German citizenship because of what happened to my family in the past. And every time I talk to uh, my German friends or just people I happen to meet, they always always comment on the silence and secrets in their family. That that gap between generations that has never really been healed um, because people won't talk about the past because it's too painful too difficult 
um, because people have been both victims and also perpetrators, um, because that is what happens in a in a in a sort of uh, terrible uh, nation state, and also in South Africa too. People do people do terrible things because they're driven to do them in in this in these types of sort of de deformed uh, nation states, and it can take generations for these problems to sort of get worked out to really come to the surface and get properly discussed. And I think South Africa with its so a great example, really, the Truth and Re Reconciliation Committee, um, Commission, sorry, uh, is it is one fantastic attempt to really try and start these conversations. But I think we also need fiction to do that because fiction provides us insights into other characters. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I, I dreamt a few years ago I had ambitions of writing a political thriller. And, um, I don't know. I don't know what actually happened to that dream because I just think also politics are quite ugly to begin with. <laughs> and so you need to, you need, when, when you're doing your research, you would, uh, I imagine that I would need to, I don't know, um, talk to some politicians and interview them and do that kind of research. Um, so that's why I abandoned it. But uh, I'm just interested in this topic of secrets and 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 also you know nations like ours. When you talk about secrets, you it it not only lies in the perpetrators of those past crimes, because when I think about my own household and my own upbringing, um, you know I remember there was a lot of that secrecy as well. Um, I remember my dad was involved in you know some of the. Um, struggle activities, we call it the struggle. So um, he'd be whisked away in the middle of the night and, or we would wake up, you know, uh, in, 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 in like at dawn and there's police in our home and, and we don't know. And as a child, you don't know, do you, you think maybe your father is a criminal or something like that, because it's also not explained why these cops are here, why are they looking for him? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so I think we also, we are, we are definitely a nation of secrets, of, 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 um, of secrets or secret bearers. And also the, the Truth and Reconciliation Com Commission for young people, um, it is dismissed as a farce because it is seen as something that tried to resolve deep, historical hurts and pains over a short period of time. And so it's seen as a very superficial exercise and it is manifest, manifesting itself in a lot of bitterness in, in, in young people because um, they feel that the struggle was not, it, it did not deliver the goods. And so they feel it didn't deliver the goods because most black people are still as poor, if not poorer than they were back in the apartheid days. So um, there's just a lot of unresolved issues, which is what, what the kind of stuff that then comes into my novels, although it comes across, I mean, I do write it in a very satirical fashion um, because it's painful stuff. So, and this is a South African characteristic that pains, we, we laugh away our pain a lot. It's just, <laughs> that's what we do. We joke about like the worst kind of pain we joke about. Um, so, so it is the writing, as artists, our contribution, whether we're writing satire or we're writing crime, is part of that process of trying to make sense of why we're here, um, how we got here, and um, is this the best place for us to be? Is this what the struggle was about in the end? Is this what we wanted? Um, like a society that's more divided than ever, a society that's even, a society who's poor, even worse off than they were before. So how, how do your novels get received in South Africa then? Who, who reads your novels? Is it, uh, are the readers uh, similar to your characters or, or are they other people? Um, it's quite broad. I mean, it's, it's, it's read even at universities. So I find a lot of, and, and my readers love reaching out. Sure, they, they love reaching out. So it's, um, it's a cross section. It's mostly women. Um, of, across different ages. Um, men love the fiction, I mean, the crime, <laughs> they love the crime writing, um, but the women, uh, for them, the social commentary really resonates a lot because what I also do with my characters is that it's mostly very strong female protagonists. Yeah. So the women um, always have strong voices. 
Um, they may be messy, but they know who they are. They have agency, which I think is what resonates with a lot of uh, uh, readers, um, especially in a society like ours. I talked about the gender-based violence and um, you know how women uh, are treated, especially in intimate relationships. I'm not saying all South African men are like that, but it's quite a prevalent thing. So having those women who are so empowered and who are so bold and who really uh, chase their dreams and are very quiet, uh, are very uh, assertive about who they are and who they where they need to be is, is is something that I think a lot of women really love about the the work that I do. Yeah. Yeah. So we got a really interesting comment in the chat box from Tony Machama about uh, what happened in Rwanda and uh, the fact that. Um, <clears throat> So you're saying, yeah, there's a sturdy silence has been imposed by the regime because people have to live next to each other um, and society has to sort of carry on. So there's not the sort of luxury in a way in that country of uh, being able to explore uh, sort of past crimes. I think that's in a, in a way that's probably true in uh, Northern Ireland too, where you see uh, very little sort of uh, official discussion of what happened during the, the civil war, um, the 30 year long civil war, because it's such a small country and people just have to sort of get on. And I think, again, that's what's provided in different types of fiction, perhaps, is an opportunity to play out some of these problems and uh, explore them. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> um, so perhaps we might talk about something a, a, a bit uh, more lighthearted. There's a lot of humour in your work, Angela, which is especially in, in The Blessed Girl. I mean, it, it's it's really comic to start with, and then it, it gets darker later. But I think humour is it is not something that you often see in in crime writing. I mean, it's not it's not a it's not a, a sort of classic thriller, but there is crime there. And uh, I'm just wondering how how you achieve that that mixture of, of humour and darker material. How how you balance it because that that's tough. <clears throat> I find, I mean, human beings were quite comical because, especially when we, <laughs> uh, we're quite comical, especially when we push to a corner. I feel that I enjoy just observing, uh, I don't know, human folly. Um, and like I said, it is a, a distinctly South African characteristic to find humor in the darkest of places. Um, and I also find it cathartic as a writer, just in my process, that if I'm dealing with a very dark topic, I mean, um, with the Black Widow Society, it's, 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 it's quite a, it's, it's vigilantism, it's vigilantism of, of women, and um, they've got this uh, hitman who's, who's a closet feminist who carries out the hits on their, <laughs> on their husband. And, and so when you write about something like that, I mean, first of all, it's just quite a, it's, it's, a, it's a ridiculous concept, I know, I mean, it's, it's, it's insane, it's crazy, so I enjoy um, uh, bringing humor into those kind of situations because um, uh, it's cathartic, humor is cathartic, humor uh, makes, makes even the most unreliable, unrelatable, the darkest, um, to be a bit palatable, I mean, a bit, you know, <laughs> we, we, we can live with this, we can, we can deal with this. So yeah, I, 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 it's just something I enjoy, I think, as a, as, as a form of expression. I think I'll be doing more satire probably as my writing evolves, yeah. Interesting. Melanie, are you drawn to writing humour? Are you tempted to include humour? in your work? Um, I'm tempted at times. Um, <laughs> and Angela, I must say, I just uh, started reading uh, The Blessed Girl on my uh, on my iPhone yesterday. And I think it's really, really great. I haven't finished it yet. But um, I think humor is very hard to write. I think um, I could write two tragedies and at the same time as, uh, as, as trying, attempting to write one comedy. I think it's, at least for me, it's much easier to make um, people feel something, anything, than making them really laugh. 
So I think that's that's really a skill that you have to own. And I haven't done that yet. Um, I'm tempted at times. Um, in my books, they're not they're not very humorous books. At times, I try to tweak dialogue at times a little bit to make people at least chuckle mm -hmm. at something. Um, because I, I think most people, even Germans, have a sense of humor, mm -hmm. <laughs> at least at times. So I think if you're trying to to write someone and you try to write them three-dimensional, of course, you have to think about the sense of humor that this character has. Mm. And everybody has some sense of humor, even if it's really dry or only comes out at very uh, rare occasions. So um, at times I, I like to have that flare up, but I don't try to write um, funny novels yet. <laughs> and I, I don't think I would be very good at that. I don't think my talent lies there. Unfortunately, I would I would love to be at that. But I think there's also a, there's a gender aspect. There's a gendered aspect to it too, because Angela, th this this book was uh, long listed for the um, Comedy Women in Print Award, and that award was set up. Um, uh, because uh, so many people in uh, British literature circles, British publishing said that that women couldn't write funny. And even though there are so many funny women writing, so th this was a sort of an, an opportunity to really highlight um, some of the sort of brilliant comedic uh, work that's, that's, that's being produced. So I think we, we kind of maybe owe it to ourselves, to our readers, to um, show that yeah, we, we can do it. We, I think too often women's writing is dismissed as being sort of like one note. So we, we, could, we're only supposed to write about certain topics in, in, in certain ways, but it's only supposed to write sort of family sagas, family literatures and so on, the sort of domestic drama. And whilst those are really powerful dramas that can encapsulate um, a lot of important topics, I, I think uh, we, we, we need to acknowledge that the women can women are writing everything, every genre, and in particular crime writing to um, <clears throat> so coming back to sort of the, what we were originally talking about. You know, we, we, we are owning crime writing too. Yeah, I think uh, Melanie, it just occurred to me that I guess humor is not as easy. I mean, it's one of those things, it's either you you your humor you're just a quirky humorous person or you know because when you have that you don't think about it like it, it just happens and you and I mean I sit um writing in like at 2 a.m in the morning and I, I just lock myself up in a room and and I'm cackling away and I'm, la and I'm thinking this is crazy I'm laughing by myself it, <laughs> and morning. I mean, am I normal? <laughs> Is it time to call the doctor? <laughs> What's going on? Um, so I think it's just it's probably something that is a personality trait as well. I'm not sure. I mean, I'm not sure if you can get yourself to be humorous. I think it's either something that's kind of a personality trait. It's in. It's kind of in your repertoire as a person, or it's not. It's, yeah, yeah, I think so too. I think I think you're really at an advantage if you just have this talent and it's it's in your personality. But I think um, I actually think it can be learned. I think um, I think you can learn to write jokes, but I think um, and I think there's a technique to it. But I think that you are just so talented in this special way that you grasp it so naturally that you're not aware that that's a technique you're doing. Um, I was actually trying to, to study humor at times just because I was interested in how it was working. And I was watching like all the American um, talk show hosts with their little stand-up routines and all that stuff. And after a while, I realized that um, there's, there's technique behind that, but I, I would have to work so hard to replicate it because I'm not naturally humorous. That would be just such a such a hassle for me, really, to do it. <laughs> so it's it's such a great talent to have innately. You're lucky, Angela. <laughs> <laughs> I never, I've never had a conversation like this. It just, it's very strange to me because it just. I, I, I guess it just happens. It's not something I think about very much. <laughs> and I was actually talking, so we, um, uh, we're adapting some of my novels um, for screenplay. 
um, so I've become quite involved in that process. And I remember having this conversation with um, my screen my screenwriting coach, and I could hear. So he's French, and I could hear him becoming irritated with me uh, because we're trying to write this screenplay for Red Ink, and and now because humor has become part of my repertoire. He kept on saying to me, remember, red ink is not a fight. This is not a fight. This is, this is not a fight story. There's no, we don't need humor here. Just focusing on the crime. And I kept thinking, why does this mean that, that this man think he has to keep repeating this to me? So I think uh, it's quite interesting, yeah. So we haven't got a huge amount of time left. I wondered if you both wanted to talk about your future projects a bit, about what you're working on at the moment and what, what's likely to be coming out in the near future, in, including uh, screenplays, because I know you both got works in development, um, in production. So that, that would be great to hear about. Melanie. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Um, I just handed in my uh, my fifth novel, and um, I think it's going to be published um, in autumn next year. So in a year roundabout, and it's I don't think it's a thriller. I think it has elements of of mystery in it. Of course, there's a big secret um, in it, um, but there's also some um magical realism and it's it's just a different uh different type of book for me Fantastic. but i think it's like um there's a development there i think um you still recognize the author but the book is a little bit different and i think i will keep on exploring nonfiction topics i think the next thing i'm mm. going to write will be nonfiction after this and yes i have some uh some mini series um and some movies in development but it's all still very shaky and as my agent always puts it we'll believe it once it's on netflix or in uh, in the cinema <laughs> never yeah. before so that's that's what i'm going with but <laughs> i think the next year is going to be exciting and really fun fantastic and angela what have you got coming uh -huh. up yeah, I'm glad you made that comment at the end, Melanie. <laughs> we believe it once we see it on Netflix. <laughs> um, okay, so with me, I am, so a, a, an international publisher has picked up Critical But Stable um, for international rights. So I'm having to do a bit of editing there, just a bit of tweaking of the, of the, of the work uh, to suit the market that we want to uh, publish it in. And uh, the same with 30th Candle, which is, uh, I think it was my, it, I don't think it was my second book. So I'm going to work on that again for the same publisher. And I have started, so, so I've started a production company and I'm working on <laughs> Um, the screenplay for Red Ink, as well as Critical But Stable. I have had some interest from a streaming service, but we'll believe it when we see it <laughs> on the screen. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so writing-wise, so I'm, I'm not in a, in, a, in a place where I can work on a, on a new novel because there's so much going on at the moment. But yeah, but I'll probably start writing again once I've put to bed some of these projects, yeah. Fantastic. And Melanie, I also wanted to ask you, um, I forgot to ask you earlier, we still got a little bit of time about your nonfiction. You, you've, you've written at least two nonfiction books um, yes. about creativity and Lady Gaga. How did yes, that come about? The Lady Gaga <laughs> thing is, is quite an outlier. I wrote a book about creativity. Yes, it's a, it's a full nonfiction book. Love doing that. It was really fun. It's one of my favorite topics in the world, creativity, because I think it's like a superpower and it really um it's it's just very empowering to to be creative um no matter what the circumstances are and uh and the book about lady gaga is um that came up with um there's a german publishing house big prestigious publishing house keepen hoyer and witch kiwi and they have um they have a series of books where they um, ask German celebrities, authors um, about, um, about short essays 
um, about a band or some musician that they have a story with or that influenced them in some way. And um, so I didn't, I didn't write a biography about Lady Gaga or something. I wrote <laughs> this super small um, book, um, part of a series. I have it here, <laughs> looks like that, um, about Lady Gaga because um, of something that happened very early in my career and that's connected to Lady Gaga. And um, so it, it's really a short essay, not a full-blown book, but it was really fun to write. And it's, um, it's in this very nice, um, in, in this nice uh, series of essays that I'm quite a fan of. So it was really fun to be asked to do that. I was thinking about what writing about Beyonce. Oh, sorry. What happened in your career that involved Lady Gaga? We want to know. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's rather a long story, but um, my career um, started very slowly because I used to be a journalist and I was always writing novels by night, trying to find a publisher. And for 10 years, I've written four novels that never got picked up. And I still have those in, in my drawers somewhere. And that was like a rough time because I was always dreaming about becoming a novelist. And I got rejected four times over a span of 10 years. And um, at the time when I was really trying to break through, Lady Gaga came along and she was just this young singer. And all of my, um, many of my friends in Cologne who I was, I was much younger than obviously I was partying with in Cologne, most of them gay, loved Lady Gaga. And I was always tired at the time because I was working as a journalist by day, then writing my stuff at night and then <laughs> going out to parties where everybody dressed up as Lady Gaga. And so I got kind of obsessed with her by um, just watching my friends, loving her music so much and this, um, this story of empowerment and just creating yourself, she's telling. She's, um, once, you, um, once you read about her, you realize that she's not about um, this natural beauty, this natural talent that you just have or you don't, but she's very much about creating herself and about struggle and a person who has a lot of problems really, um, but um, is trying to... Um, stay strong through them and who's not putting on a perfect facade, but who's very vulnerable and, uh, and raw in many ways. And that impressed me. And um, it's about just this time in my life about dancing to Lady Gaga tunes with my <laughs> friends in the club. So it sounds amazing, sounds amazing, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> that's, that's brilliant. Do you think you're gonna be writing more nonfiction in the future? Or is that just a one-off, two-off? <laughs> I think I do it again. Mm -hmm. I think it's it's really fun to um, to go back to my journalist roots, mm -hmm. and um, there's a lot of topics that I would like to to explore. So I have I have a list of of, of things that I that I would consider, and um, yeah, definitely, definitely. Would, would you be Would you be wanting to write sort of real life crime, crime nonfiction, or are you going to keep crime safely in the in the fiction category? Um, I think I would keep crime safely in the fiction category <laughs> um, because I think um, the dark mysteries I'm writing um, they express one part of my personality and one part of of a myriad of things that I'm interested in. And it's so nice to be able to, to explore other topics and, and be really broad as an author. And I'm very happy that my publishing house is letting me do that. Um, just um, showing multiple facets of, um, of, of who I am and what I'm interested in. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's something I admire about both of you is that you've both, you both write it in different ways and different genres and different categories. And I think it can be energizing as a writer. Some, when I've written a novel in the past, I know that I've really wanted to write in a different form, a different type of writing afterwards. I cannot stand, when I've been writing a long novel, I cannot stand to look at novel, think, even think about novel writing. So it's, it can be sort of, it can be really helpful, energizing to think about different forms, uh, different yeah. types of writing. It's like a palate cleanser. 
Yeah. Like writing nonfiction after you've tried to birth a world with all its characters in it. It's yeah. like <laughs> That's right. It really is. Yes. It's bringing everything to life. So we've got some lovely comments in the chat box uh, from Tony. Uh, decadent decades, Melanie. <laughs> Journalist by day, gaga dancer in cologne clubs by night, and crack creative writer in the faint light of pre dawn. <laughs> It's the sort of thing I think you can only do when you're young. <laughs> Even just having one job now is uh, pretty exhausting in my middle age. <laughs> so I think we're coming to the close of uh, tonight's event. Um, I'd really like to thank both of you wonderful, generous uh, speakers. You've been fantastic. And I'm really grateful for the insights that you've shared with us about your work. And I hope everyone has in enjoyed tonight's event. I think we've got another event tomorrow night um, in this series of the Virtually Yours uh, Festival. Zoe, would you All like right. to it's, say um, more? And uh, tomorrow night is going to be in French, um, but translated into English. Um, so the other way around from what we had tonight. And it's um, German writer Anne Weber and uh, Beata um, Umobieni. And um, it's called, I can only say the um, English title Lost and Found in Translation because my French is um, not so good. <laughs> and um, the moderator will be Merdi Mukore. Okay. <laughs> and I hope to see you all tomorrow night. And for this event. And thanks to everyone. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Angela. And thank you, Pippa. Thank thanks you very so much. Sorry. It's been great. I've really enjoyed it. It was, it, it was really a wonderful talk. I, I learned a lot about the two of you and, of course, about um, the way you approach crime writing. And this is always so interesting to, to hear about this and about creativity <laughs> and the social comedy. It was really great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it as well. Me too. Thank you so much. It's been really great. Angela, great to meet you. And thank you so much, Pippa. And thanks, Zoe, for the invitation. Yes. I really thoroughly enjoyed it. Pleasure. <laughs> so, um, yes, have a good night then. And yeah. um, hope to see you all tomorrow then. Yes. That's great. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. -bye. Good <laughs> thank, you, thank you, Pippa. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>